Since this is a Saturday afternoon, I'm going to read one of the funnier stories from this, uh, Goobers. I don't think I've read the story Goobers at a Balticon before, so I'm going to read that. One of the zombie stories in What Will Come After. Uh, something, something light. All right. Willard woke to echoing screams. The sound didn't bother him at all. He'd gotten used to those screams over the past few months, so used to them, in fact, that by now it had become something of a ritual for him. Wake to the sounds of fear, start a new reel up in the theater's projection booth, fall asleep a moment or two later, jolt awake whenever the audience freaked out at the scary parts, and then get ready to start another new reel. Lately, he'd been spending more time on the job sleeping than waking. Still, he hadn't missed a cue for changing a reel yet. Chocolate. He smelled chocolate. When he touched his cheek, his fingers came away brown. He glanced down to the remnants of a box of raisinets scattered across his desk and realized that he'd fallen asleep face down, melting them into the desktop. It wasn't the first time he'd stirred to find himself like that. Movies always went better with a snack, and that he sometimes ended up face down and them didn't change that fact. When Dan, his boss, had first switched over to his all-zombie, all-the-time lineup, Willard had occasionally peeked out to see what had made the audiences scream, but it was never anything worth his effort, just caro syrup, food coloring, and pig entrails. He quickly became bored sick with the repetitive nature of these undead flicks, with corpses jumping out of closets, with brain munchers, with doubters who died and believers who, well, who seemed to die anyway. Night of the Living Dead, the incredibly strange creatures who stopped living and became mixed up zombies. Voodoo Dawn. Willard thought them all ridiculous, thought Dan's whole theme idea ridiculous, and longed for the variety of the old days, but that's why he was only the projectionist and not the manager, for it looked as if his boss had guessed right, had made the right business decision. Terrifying reports were coming out of the big cities every day, so Dan had figured that, given the chance, customers might turn to the movies to soak up all they could about the coming plague, might choose to sift through the cinematic past in search of survival tips. Dan had been right, ticket sales were through the roof. Willard was stunned. What fiction could teach anyone at a time like this, he just couldn't see. But he didn't complain, at least not out loud. The concept kept him employed when so many other types of businesses were failing under the threat of an approaching apocalypse. People seemed to get something out of the unreal dead, and what's more, bought out the concession stand while they did so. Movies and candy went hand in hand, which meant that Willard's hand was guaranteed to go hand in hand with a weekly paycheck which was just fine with him, so when he muttered, he muttered quietly. He found it hard to believe what was going on in New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, all those big cities that had once seemed impossibly distant and now felt terribly close. Even with the news footage that confronted him each morning, it still seemed like, like a movie. And yet what the television showed him each day, though it mimicked what he spooled each night, that was real. Graves splitting open, the dead coming back to new life, people being eaten alive, their shredded remnants rising to begin the cycle all over again. He used to envy those who lived in the metropolises, but no more. The country was falling apart, or more precisely, being eaten alive, and no one knew exactly why. The shots from the theater were still going on longer than seemed necessary, and not just in response to some tense, fleeting moment on the screen. They were continuous now, almost a living, breathing thing. Willard, who had long since given up on the audience, slid his wheeled stool forward so he could peer through the small square window and into the crowd below. In the flickering light, as the sluggish zombies stalked humans upon the screen, Willard could see the same scene enacted in the bowels of the theater, only the zombies below were not so sluggish as the ones above. Two zombies toyed with an old woman, each holding an opposite arm as they played a ghoulish tug of war. Her arms grew shorter as they ate their way from knuckles through wrists, then elbows. The higher they chewed, the more wildly she thrashed until she could take no more and fell to the worn carpeting where Willard could not see her. One of the undead cradled a young boy in his arms, gnawing on the skull, seeking the soft treasure within. One man moved wildly back and forth in the middle of a row, trapped as zombies approached him from either end. As they came within reach, he leapt forward toward the screen, hurtling over the line of seats, falling, grunting, getting up to leap again and again, until he got to the very front row where he became lost in a waiting mob of hungry hands. Those not under immediate attack ran for the exits, but were washed back into the theater by waves of further zombies thrusting in the doors. Willard couldn't bear to watch, but he watched horrified anyway, and this time he lost track of time. 
The projector spun it out without him remembering to cue the next reel, and suddenly, all that was ahead in the theater was the huge white rectangle of the screen. The room was brighter than before, and as the free end of the reel snapped repeatedly beside him, he could see the mayhem even more clearly. He could take no more, so he killed the projector, which sent the theater into darkness. He slid to the floor, where he listened to the screams and crunching sounds in the darkness. Eventually, the screaming stopped, but the crunching went on. He became lost in his mind, only made aware of the outer world again by the sound of feet shuffling across the cracked linoleum outside the door of the locked projection room. After some prints had been stolen, Dad had reinforced the door, and this wasn't the first time Willard found himself thankful for that. He hoped it wouldn't be the last. The lurker outside brought on an upswelling of panic. Willard needed to get out, but the sound of the door told him that there was nowhere to go. If the zombies could reach to the heart of the city to feed on the customers of the theater, then the rest of the city had to be in the same state. Though his goose flesh tried to tell him otherwise, he was probably safest where he was. And yet, even though he'd been snacking since the beginning of his shift, the knot at the pit of his stomach told him he couldn't stay still for long. He scooped up the last of the raisinets, but a handful of pellets, looking not so very different from rabbit droppings, would do little to feed his hunger. He was a man used to keeping his stomach full, but it wasn't only that. He, he knew that he had to get out of that room to get some more food or else he'd starve in there, and how stupid would that be? The projection room was barely larger than a coffin, and he normally couldn't wait to rush out of there at the end of each shift. He certainly couldn't bear the thought of spending eternity there. He needed time to think, to plan where he could possibly go that would be safe, but first he needed some food. He wasn't the kind of man who could plot a course of action when hungry. He listened to the darkness below, but could not tell whether the zombies were resting there silently after their gorging, or had gone on to other conquests, searching the theater for more victims, victims like him. He needed to create a distraction, and he smiled, because luck had given him one of the greatest distractions ever invented. He started up the projector once more, hoping that the bellowing sounds of life from the theater's speakers would draw away the zombie at the door, as well as any others who wanted the halls in a dull imitation of hope, long enough for him to sneak down to the concession stand. He pressed in the ear to the door and could bear, hear the shambling grow louder at first, as if a creature that did nothing of scurrying was attempting to rush off, but then the sound dimmed. When the hallway seemed clear, Willard nervously opened the door. There seemed little evidence of the zombies passing. In fact, a smear of blood that stretched across the wall mixed so well with the general dinginess that Dan had allowed to descend upon the theater that Willard at first did not notice it. Only when his hand slid across the stain and he realized that it was wet to the touch did he feel a true sense of fear and almost bolted back to the room. But he knew that way held no promise of escape. He took the stairs down slowly, cursing each creak, glad he'd turned the speakers up as loud as possible. He paused before the swinging double doors to the theater, searching for the courage that would let him peer within. He could not bring himself to raise his eyes to the small circular windows in either door, and so when he pressed his eye to the thin crack between them, and so he pressed his eye to the thin crack between them. He could make out movement there, but he could make out nothing of the details. After what he'd seen from above, he knew that it was probably better that way. He retreated to what had once been a well-stocked candy counter, which was now an explosion of sugar and shattered glass. Colorful boxes spilled out onto the floor, their contents sprayed wide, apparently open not from being sampled, but from being stepped on. The floor seemed like something Jackson Pollock would have created, red blood overlaid with red ketchup, and then blended with mustard and dollops of relish. The hot dogs were tumbled down beside the vast stain, having been knocked from the wire tree on which they'd spun. Many of them would bite snatch from them, but as far as Willard could tell, none had more than one. They'd each been tasted and rejected. Zombies didn't like their meat cooked. Listening carefully for any sudden sounds from the theater, he stuffed his pockets with goobers and dots and Nestle's chocolate-covered pretzel bites. This wasn't the first time he'd taken candy without paying for it. The difference was, though, that before it had only been Dan he'd worried about catching him. But back then, he couldn't resist, couldn't bear to watch a movie without his mouth in motion. Most people were like that. He gave the remnants of the hot dogs the last long, hungry look, knowing that they were probably what would best sustain him through whatever was to come. But he couldn't bear the thought of eating them, not now, not without knowing for sure which had or had not been chomped at by a zombie, or even merely touched. He suddenly remembered the freezer, and so he squeezed behind the counter, hoping that its stainless steel doors had proved too tough for the zombies to open with their thick fingers. Perhaps he could find some frozen hot dogs there that he'd be able to stomach. Instead, there was Dan, or what was left of Dan. 
The man's eyelids were open, but there were no longer any eyes within. His arms were bent and broken, and physician's arms and legs were not meant to go, and the way he'd been left made what remained of him look like the remnants of a fried chicken dinner. The clothing shredded off his skin, the skin clumsily shredded off his flesh, and in many cases the flesh shredded entirely off his bones. Willard was able to suppress a scream, but he couldn't control his leaden feet, which caused him to scramble back and thud against the wall. He could hear a scrabbling movement swell within the theater in response, and his heart, which had seemed to stop, started up again. He ran back toward the only refuge he knew, taking the stairs three at a time until he was locked in the projection room again. Exhausted, he checked the lock three times and then pulled his pockets inside out and emptied his candy onto the desk before the packages could melt into a sugary mess. After he caught his breath, he nervously approached the window and peered out into the theater again. His eyes adjusted to the darkness, a darkness made less black by a zombie island massacre flickering across the screen and by the strips of tiny lights that sparkled along the carpeting on either side of each aisle. Some zombies stumbled up and down those aisles, tripping over the scattered bones and bodies that remained from the feast. But others were actually perched in the worn padded seats. He could not see their faces. He wasn't even sure, due to the manner of their deaths, whether they even had faces or whether he could have read their emotions there even if he'd seen them. But their body language, the way their shoulders tilted forward and their heads tilted back, he would swear that they were almost expectant. They actually seemed to be looking at the screen. It seemed ridiculous to even think it, but they appeared to be watching the movie. He too looked out at the screen, which showed a group of bloated zombies shambling along. He wondered if, just as humans had once come to the theater looking for information on what was going to happen to them if the zombies truly came, for help on how they were going to behave in a new world, the zombies could be doing the same. Maybe they also felt the need, at least those for whom humanity was not so far behind, to figure out the strange society that was to come and how to perform their parts in the ghastly play. There was only one way Willard could learn whether this was true, whether the zombies were just sitting there, only looking at the screen by coincidence, or whether it was something more. Perhaps they were struggling to remember the act of going to a movie. He had to know. He was perhaps the only one in the world in such an odd situation as to be capable of knowing. And so, with a dedication he'd never known when this was just a job and the audience was only made of customers, he spooled reel after reel and watched and waited. He screamed, white zombie, zombies on Broadway, and even the deliriously awful Plan 9 from outer space, running through all the films that Dan and his wisdom had stocked. Dan would never know what had happened, but Willard would not let his foresight go to waste. A sugar high coursed through him as he watched the theater and its inhabitants. The changes there were slow and at first subtle ones. With each passing moment, more zombies came, shuffling down the aisles in apparent random motion. Some wandered off again, but others stayed and sat until Will had finally noticed that the theater had become packed without him realizing it, with every seat taken. Those newcomers who arrived after that merely stood in the aisles, rocking in place as they stared at the screen. They were hypnotized, seduced into submission by the same special effects that Willard had previously mocked. They seemed to make no distinction between the gore of Dawn of the Dead and the forest of Dead Alive. They were equally wrapped by all. As he gobbled his way through his precious stockpile of candy, he tried to discern what they were looking for up there on the screen. He prayed that one zombie would turn to another so he could see their faces and decode what they were waiting for. But unlike humans in the theater, they seemed to have nothing to say to each other. And even though they were together, they were alone. All he could ever see was the back of their heads. It was maddening. The movies were teaching them something he knew it. He was teaching them, as he'd been teaching humans for years. But this time, he felt the need to see it happening. They were listening to his movies. He knew they would listen to him. He unlocked the door of the projection room and found the hallway deserted, as he knew it would be. The films had netted them all. Once downstairs, he moved slowly down a narrow side corridor that ran along the length of the theater and led him up on the stage behind the screen. He folded back an edge of the screen and peered through the audience of the undead. Their faces were tilted up, and Willard felt as if they were looking at him rather than just the screen. He knew he could reach them, just knew that he could. He stepped around the screen and walked to the center of the stage. As the film flickered against his body, he began to speak. Listen to me, he said, but was allowed to get no further, for soon all that came from his lips were his own echoing screams, only this time there was no one left for those screams to wake. And as dozens of zombies munched down on him, 
the film brightening the air around him and the actors above going through their ghoulish paces, one final thought went through Willard's mind. He'd been right all along. Whether zombie or human, it was still a universal truth that all movies went better with a snack. Thank you. And that's it. What will come after, which contains all of my zombie stories, though there'll be more to come.